Meh. The weather has been cold and damp, and we're unable to do any testing on the cement mixer powered go kart. So, we're going to go off topic a little bit with this bonus video. The new thing we're going to try is bonus videos, and they'll cover technical stuff that not everybody wants to watch. We really should have another channel for tech stuff, but for now, we'll just call them bonus videos. This one's actually very entertaining, and the tech stuff is mild, and you might learn a thing or two. Off camera, we do a lot of stuff, and sometimes we actually show you things that we haven't talked about yet. As a matter of fact, it surprises me how much stuff people see in the videos that get past the editor. <clears throat> so in the comment section of a previous video, someone pointed out the bolts for the headlight on the driver's side of the car were missing. And that's great, because I forgot about those, and I'll screw them back in soon, but not now. Anyway, a lot of folks saw the mini alternator that we have on the cement mixer engine. And yeah, it's been generating power to keep the battery charged for a while now. I reckon this is an important detail that we should talk about, especially since this is not the only thing we've tried. So first off, the placement of the alternator is somewhat awkward, and that's because we're reserving the flywheel side of the engine to drive the stupid charger. But that's a story for another day. So this is the mini alternator. As I recall, the original application was for a John Deere tractor of some sort. According to the propaganda, these little alternators are good for a maximum of 20 amps. Now, I don't know if I believe that, but that's the word on the street. What makes this alternator unique and more suitable for our application is that it operates with permanent magnets instead of field windings. So check this out. When I spin the pulley, you can see how the alternator cogs. That's from the permanent magnets. So the magnets replace the field windings, and that makes the alternator simple. But it also means the alternator needs to spin pretty fast to generate power. So in other words, this alternator won't make power when the engine's at idle. Now that's both good and bad. The good part is the alternator won't drag down the engine at idle, and of course the bad part is it won't charge the battery. Well, this car more or less has two speeds, idle and wide open throttle, and we don't spend a lot of time at idle. I would be remiss if I didn't show how to make all the electrical connections for folks who might be interested in using this on one of their projects. Now the alternator is only part of the system. It needs to be connected to the rectifier slash voltage regulator in order to make DC power. Unfortunately, there's no harness or pigtails to connect the alternator to the regulator, so you'll need to fabricate some of your own wiring. Let's go to Make Believe Land as I animate the connections. Here in Make Believe Land, anything's possible. For clarity, let's get rid of the existing wires. That's better. Now that doesn't mean you need to cut off the wires. It's just for the animation. So the two blue wires from the alternator connect to the two blue wires at the regulator, and the order doesn't matter. The black wire on the regulator can be attached directly to ground, or if you wish, you can connect it to the negative side of the battery, although grounding it is both easier and keeps the length of the wire short. The red wire goes directly to the battery. Now this wire is only 16 gauge, and it needs to be as short as possible. According to the wire gauge calculator, one foot would carry the full 20 amps this alternator supposedly produces. However, there will be a voltage drop. Voltage drops are bad because it means the wire is heating up. Now for our cement mixer powered go-kart, we don't expect to draw any more than 6 amps when testing the car, so the voltage drop would be minimum. The yellow wire goes to the positive side of the ignition switch. This lead needs to get a positive 12 volts whenever the ignition is turned on. The green wire is for the idiot light, and this system will work fine without this connection. However, if you want the idiot light, connect this wire to a light bulb and ground the other side of the bulb. A standard miniature light bulb will work fine, or you can use an LED indicator made for 12 volt systems. So here's a peek at something we do to boost the horsepower during the performance testing. We added a second switch here, so we can temporarily turn off the alternator while doing 0 to 60 acceleration tests. This little mod keeps the alternator from robbing any additional power we so desperately need. Now, this isn't part of the normal installation. This is a robot cantina top secret. I'm not affiliated with any sponsors because I reserve the right to tell the truth. Anyway, this alternator is available for many resources and you're free to shop around. The Jungle site has these for a reasonable price, but quality is always suspect. Keep that in mind. Now what's interesting is some of these alternators have blue wires and some have yellow wires. No idea why. The color of the wires doesn't matter. The same with the voltage regulators. Sometimes they're shown with different color codes. So when shopping, keep an eye out for that. So some would ask, hey Jimbo, why not use the charging coils under the flywheel? Ah, uh, this is going to be painful. Well, the long story is they don't generate enough power. 
If you use two charging coils, the most you can expect is two amps at wide open throttle. The charging coils are enough to trickle charge the battery, but they won't supply the power we need for the fuel injection. No doubt they help, but using them still requires the car be connected to a battery charger between road tests. So, what if all you needed to do was trickle charge the battery? Well, that's a different story. The charging coils will work, but keep in mind the engine needs to run at 3600 RPM or more to get full potential from them. So we played around with the charging coils on various voltage regulators, and this is what we found. The GY6 regulator is useless. Some folks say they work, they do not. Now this one's only a rectifier, and what that means it only has diodes in it. Anyway, it should work, but this one arrived from Amazon pre-broken, and one of the internal diodes was FUBAR right out of the box. Did I mention it was from Amazon? Oh well, you can't always win. So what works? Well, so far nothing we tested could both rectify the AC into DC and regulate at the same time. The best we found was this bridge rectifier from an appliance. With this you get about 2 amps to charge the battery, but there is no regulation, so it's possible to overcharge a small battery if the engine runs at full throttle for periods greater than a few hours. On larger batteries, there's still a risk of overcharging, but most likely this will replenish a fully charged battery after using the electric starter. It really depends on how long you run the engine. Again, the charging coils under the flywheel only offer a trickle charge and nothing else. You can't use them to charge the battery and to run accessories. Well, you could, but the battery would eventually discharge. So let's go back to Make Believe Land and see how you can connect the bridge rectifier to trickle charge the battery. First, you have to identify the plus terminal for the proper orientation. Most bridge rectifiers are marked with the plus symbol and two AC or tilde symbols. The negative side is sometimes marked, but is often assumed. The plus terminal goes to the plus side of the battery. If you're running one charge coil, then that wire goes to any of the terminals marked AC or with the tilde symbol. If you're running two charge coils, then the other wire goes to the other AC terminal. The negative terminal on this full bridge rectifier is not connected to anything. Don't do it. Don't do it. Connecting this terminal will create an electrical paradox and you will generate a space-time vortex that will consume everything. Actually, it causes a short circuit in the charging coils because they're grounded to the engine block. So to complete the circuit, you need to connect the engine block to the negative side of the battery. So we have a full bridge rectifier, but we're only using half of it. Well, the reason we're using a full bridge rectifier is because it's cheap and it's easy to mount. We can't use the full bridge because of the way the charging coils are grounded to the engine block. If you disagree, I recommend you try it and then report back, if you survive. Of course, there's always someone in the comments that'll say, uh, why can't you just use two diodes? And yeah, you could do that, absolutely. But like I said, we suggest the full bridge rectifier because they're cheap and easy to mount. If you want to play around with diodes, then go for it. So let's test the alternator out. This crazy mess of wires is part of a temporary shunt that we'll use to measure the current or amps the alternator produces. Let's look at a cartoon picture for clarity. If you recall, the red wire goes to the battery, and more to the point, this is the wire that carries the current to charge the battery. If we place a shunt here, we can now measure how much current the little alternator produces. So in case you're wondering why we're using a shunt, it's because the alternator allegedly produces more current than my very expensive fluke meter can handle. So in this setup, we use the shunt to avoid destroying more stuff, <clears throat> and the meter connects to the shunt like this. At idle we can see the alternator is producing a few amps, which is pretty good, but here on the dashboard we can see the idiot light is flashing. Well, the alternator is working, but just barely, and that's exactly what we want for our project. Now when we rev up the engine, the alternator really starts making current. Normally we expect to see about 5 amps, but since we just started the engine, the alternator is recharging the battery and it's supplying current to run the fuel injection. As the battery gets charged, the current will eventually drop off to the expected 5 amps. And we can see on the dashboard the idiot light is no longer flashing. Turning on the headlights and the windshield wipers raises the current significantly. Now off camera we were able to get just over 19.5 amps out of this setup, and that's close enough to what they advertised. Now let's use our top secret cheater switch. And as expected, the alternator shuts off, giving us a little bit more power to send to the wheels for the purpose of accelerating as fast as possible. 
And now we turn the alternator back on. Not too shabby. Now there's something we also did that helps reduce drag on the engine, and that is to drive the alternator at a 1 to 1 ratio. Typically alternators are driven at a 2 or more to 1 ratio, and that helps keeps the battery charged at idle. So there was a lot of thought that went into this, and we took extra steps to optimize the alternator for our application. In the end, it was a win-win for this project. Okay, just one more thing, because I know someone will ask, why don't I use an alternator from a car? Well, we could. They're easy to hook up, and you can get them cheap at the scrapyard, but the problem is they charge at idle, and that could potentially cause our engine to stall because of the load. It's certainly debatable, but the less effective John Deere alternator is probably best for our application. So for an automotive alternator, let's take a look at one of our dyno benches. This gizmo is one of our test stands, and it's more or less for tuning carburetors on the smaller 212cc engines. As you can see from this side, the engine's connected to a 140 amp GM alternator. I guess you could use something from another brand, but GM stuff is what I'm familiar with. This is an extreme example of generating electrical power, and when I say extreme, I mean the alternator puts out way too much power for our needs, which normally isn't a problem, but keep in mind it can also absorb a lot of horsepower, and that's something we don't have in our cement mixer powered car. Now in a moment, we'll take a look at how much power the alternator absorbs, but first let's take a tour of the whole test stand. First off, we have a 212cc Predator engine, nothing special, just a test mule for carburetors and exhaust systems. Of course, there's the 140 amp GM alternator. Over here we have a shunt for measuring the current or amps that the alternator is generating. And here's the display for the shunt, and right next to the amp gauge is the volt gauge. Let's take a look at where we send all the power the alternator generates. Now this is the load bank and it can absorb about 100 amps. It's basically just a bunch of power resistors and it converts the electrical power into heat. And these of course are the cooling fans. So this is the control box for this rig. This box is more or less empty and it's just something we can mount the switches to. These switches turn on relays that connect the alternator to the load bank. Each switch dumps about 15 amps into the load bank, give or take. So let's take this thing for a ride. So after the engine's warmed up, we can engage the alternator by flipping the switch. Now, on this particular alternator, once it's turned on, you cannot turn it off. Flipping the switch backwards has no effect. Anyway, on the amp gauge, we can see the alternator is putting out a nominal charge. Now keep in mind, the battery is fully charged. If it wasn't, the engine would have stalled immediately after turning on the alternator. Let's see what happens if we add a light load. Aww. So right there is why we don't use a regular car alternator for the cement mixer powered project vehicle. Just for fun, let's throw a full load on this little 6.5 horsepower engine. Oh, she's working hard. Unfortunately, there's no way to calculate how much horsepower the alternator is absorbing. The meter says it's over 100 amps, and that calculates to about 2 horsepower, but the efficiency of the alternator is unknown. The alternator efficiency factor, which is part of calculating how much horsepower is being absorbed, is variable, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 percent. Anyway, all alternators are different, but on GM alternators, the connections are fairly simple. I reckon most other alternators with internal regulators are basically the same. So the big lug on the back of the alternator goes directly to the battery. One of the wires will go to the ignition switch, and this wire is energized whenever the ignition is turned on. And another wire will go to the idiot light. So, on most alternators, this has to be an old school light bulb. An LED indicator for automotive use will not work most of the time. Now, if you don't make the idiot light connection, chances are the alternator won't work at all. Keep in mind there are many different types of alternators out there with internal regulators, and they all work mostly the same way. GM stuff is cheap and well documented, so that's why I use them. So that's pretty much it for today's bonus video. This video was obviously way off topic when it comes to going as fast as possible with a cement mixer powered car, but hopefully it clarifies why we use the mini alternator and perhaps it gives you ideas for a future project. Until next time.